Good afternoon. I want to uh, thank uh, our federal panel today. This is the uh, continuation of our uh, meetings on uh, the Maritime Transportation Data Initiative. We're working through industry perspectives on uh, the sort of information data uh, uh, that should be provided uh, to the shipping public uh, to make the system more efficient and, uh, and operate better. Uh, we've been in discussions, uh, the Federal Maritime Commission has with uh, other federal agencies. Uh, we were on a, a phone the other day with uh, DOT, so we've already started uh, the process of co uh, coordinating with, with our federal partners and look forward to doing that in the future uh, as we work uh, through uh, the process of identifying uh, the uh, data that's out there, uh, the data that needs to be uh, provided uh, when uh, and and, and in what form and, uh, and where we have data gaps. Um, uh, uh, I wanna thank our, our participants for joining us today. Uh, we appreciate your time, your, your uh, interest, uh, and this is uh, critical uh, and our role is to listen to you. Uh, participants have been forwarded the questions, so we'll, we will jump right into the questions. Participants have also forwarded us their bios, which have been circulated and will save us time on introductions. These meetings are being recorded and will be uh, posted on the FMC YouTube page and on the Maritime uh, Transportation Data Initiative, MTDI uh, webpage. Uh, please, if one of the participants chooses to share something, uh, use the share function uh, for the public to be able to review that. Uh, I'd also like to point out this is a live public meeting. Only participants will be able to speak. We will be posting the meeting on the MTDI TDI webpage for public access. However, we welcome and in fact encourage public input. You can email us your uh, feedback, uh, feedback on uh, data gaps and data needs at maritimedata at fmc.gov. Should you choose to submit public feedback, please reference whether it is in reference to an individual meeting or whether it is a general comment. Also, we will be posting, posting submitted materials and comments on our webpage. We cannot post PowerPoints so we ask that material be submitted in Word or PDF format. Please do not include any personal identifiable information on any submissions to the FMC. We will continue these meetings every Tuesday at 3 p.m. leading up to our Federal Maritime Commission uh, Maritime Transportation Data Initiative Summit this spring. Last week, we had a really good meeting with the uh, chassis industry and uh, and 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 uh, other uh, groups that we've been uh, talking to. Uh, um, and so uh, uh, I did wanna talk a little bit about the challenge in this, this area before we uh, go to the uh, participants and, and, and get their observations. Um, I was talking to John Porcari uh, just recently, the Port Envoy uh, from the White House. And uh, we were talking about the challenges in the maritime environment, which carries so much cargo. Uh, Really, it's critical uh, in terms of what, as a nation, we're facing uh, with inflation and, and record record imports. Uh, we have a trade imbalance that's uh, the worst ever uh, in our nation because of the volume of imports coming into the United States, and it's creating issues for uh, exports, for instance, uh, uh, U.S. agricultural exports. Um, but in, on on the maritime data side. Uh, uh, compared to aviation, aviation, you have sort of real-time information about movements. You know where a plane's going to be. You know when it gets to the airport, the system that's going to be employed. People are tracking the movement of, of people uh, and, and aircraft and, and uh, ancillary equipment being used and the movement of passengers. In the maritime side, we get very little direct real-time data uh, at the level of the federal government. It's all under the control of the private sector. As I was looking through what I can see as federal data, and we have the Coast Guard's 96 hour rule for the arrival of vessels, and CBP uh, has the 24 hour uh, uh, manifest rule, which requires cargo to be uh, described. Uh, the 14 different data elements provided to the US government and the HTS harmonized tariff uh, system uh, and, the, and the other data elements. Uh, and that's uh, it's transmitted to, to CBP. But after that, those sort of uh, transactions, uh, which are EDI static transactions, uh, all the information that's out there resides in the public uh, sector um, and, and is disseminated as they see fit 
uh, primarily to their customers as, as they should, uh, but it creates all sorts of issues when we look about management of the system. So I'm very interested in finding out uh, from you uh, whether what sort of data uh, that your agencies get that's real time. Uh, in addition to this, I, I've looked at trucking and other areas. I, I, I think a lot of our other data is accumulated data uh, aggregated data uh, that's used for forecasting and, and assessment. But I'd be interested if there are sort of information areas where I am not uh, uh, aware of uh, that where the federal government is getting affirmative real-time data. Uh, and so, and then uh, as uh, we mentioned prior to this meeting, uh, Dr. Kristen uh, Monaco is our uh, head of the Bureau of Transportation Analysis. Uh, she's a, a firm, uh, uh, a believer in, 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 in data and, and she wants to talk to you a little bit about uh, challenges that you face with, uh, with different areas of uh, data. Um, we've got a great uh, group of panelists today. We've got uh, April Taylor uh, uh, from the uh, Department of Agriculture um, uh, AMS program. Uh, we've got uh, Olivia Volkoff, Policy Advisor, uh, Department of Commerce. Uh, James Swanson, uh, the uh, Director of Cargo Security and Controls at U.S. Customs and Border Protection. Uh, Baron Linforce, a statistician, statistician from the uh, Census Bureau. And April uh, Taylor, uh, uh, oh, actually, uh, April Taylor uh, uh, from uh, USDA. Um, uh, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Matt Chambers, uh, who's our first uh, 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 person uh, uh, on the list and Senior Transportation Specialist, Bureau of Transportation Statistics, uh, DOT. Uh, uh, Matthew, why don't you lead off? Hey, thank you, Commissioner. Um, so I guess I'll just go through, uh, we've provided questions ahead of time um, and I'll just kind of talk through those. And then I guess we'll do the open discussion after that. Um, so I don't know, did you want to read off the questions for everybody listening? No, no you go ahead, go ahead okay. right into your stuff and everybody. And I do know that there's going to be some, um, some overlap in terms of things, but don't really worry about that. It helps okay. actually to, uh, so go ahead and make your observations and trigger off those uh, observations of others, but you're first, so uh, you got okay. the floor. All right, thank you. All right, well, the Bureau of Transportation Statistics compiles and disseminates port data as part of its Port Performance Rate Statistics Program. The goal of this program is to provide nationally consistent perform measures of performance for the nation's largest ports and to report annually to Congress on port capacity and throughput. Um, these include the top 25 ports by tonnage, 20-foot equivalent unit, TEU, and dry bulk tonnage. We publish a set of continuously updated port data tables and report a snapshot of these to Congress each January. So our report just came out January 15th, 2022, um, along with some other uh, things that we put together each year. This data includes port characteristics, vessel calls by type, vessel dwell times, and these are um, what Commissioner Bensel was mentioning. Uh, these are for, based on AIS data, which is a good real-time source of data, um, and then updates specific to each port. Um, also, we compile and disseminate maritime trade and transportation statistics uh, in our publications, such as the National Transportation Statistics and Freight Facts and Figures, which, is in, which features interactive visualizations and tables that provide a snapshot of freight transportation. And this touches on the intermodal and multimodal. Uh, water transportation is the leading mode of transportation for international freight shipped to and from the US. Additionally, we conduct the national census of ferry operators to collect passenger and vehicle boardings on all ferries in the US. The most recent census collected 2019 data and the next one will collect 2022 data. The census includes characteristics of ferry operations, vessels, terminals, and trips between terminals. Ferry operations are highly variable from large urban transportation systems to small river crossings in rural areas. Ferries also provide lifeline service to islands as well. Additionally, the NCFO collects information on connectivity to other modes of transportation, such as local and inner city bus and rail, as well as parking availability. So did you want me to go ahead and go into the next slide? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go, right. to your, go ahead to whatever. I want you to go through your uh, stuff and, and then we'll take it from there to the next one. Just tell me when you're done. Okay, excellent. Um, fully understanding data standards is critical. 
the definitions of ports vary widely um, under legal definitions in between data sources. Uh, for example, we work closely with the US Army Corps of Engineers. They use port limits as defined by legislative enactments of federal, state, and local governments for the US waterborne commerce statistics. And we have someone from Census to talk about this, but uh, the US Census Bureau uses the US Customs and Border Protection Port Districts, which is also known as Schedule D, for their US foreign trade statistics. And of course, both these differ from the US Ar uh, Coast Guard Port Districts. All the port data published by our program is coded using the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers port definitions and names. Similarly, there is several ways to describe and code vessel types. These are widely used for everything from vessel chartering to international safety regulations. For example, I just mentioned the uh, Automatic Identification System, or AIS, uh, Ship to Shore and Ship to Ship Safety Communication and Collision Avoidance System. Um, has a coding scheme for ship type, which is widely used by Coast Guard and many others around the world. The AIS ship type provides a simplified type, such as cargo, tanker, fishing, or towing, for example. Uh, we use the international classification of ship type, also known as ICST. The ICST provides greater specificity than the AIS ship type, which is just a two-digit code. Um, such as cargo vessel subtype. We've been focusing a lot on container ships, so you need a little more detail to go from a two-digit to a multi-digit code, uh, vehicle carrier, and as well as the various types of tankers. And I'll mention the uh, National Census of Ferry Operators processing requires definitions to bring commonality and consistency to the ferry data. For example, naming conventions are often not the same between biennial uh, collections or ferry operators who may share a common terminal or run similar routes, but use different naming conventions. BTS is working to standardize these names and edit processes to make the ferry data more consistent and timely. And following up on the last question here, um, form must follow function. Any data sets should have data dictionaries, keys, notes, and sources. The ultimate product or system should define the data standard and the level of documentation especially if interoperability. Uh, we work closely with Army Corps and within the Department of Transportation with the Maritime Administration. The ability to connect and exchange data between modal partners is key. As previously mentioned, we've adopted the US Army Corps of Engineers port definitions in the ICST ship types for our program. These are authoritative and widely accepted. Uh, detailed documentation must be provided when existing data formats or standards can't be adopted. Specifically, the documentation should include commonality, uh, provide data crosswalks, as well as note any differences, as I've already noted with port definitions, and any other applicable data standard. Of course, utilizing an existing widely accepted standard is always best if it meets your needs and if it's possible. However, this may not always be a viable option. Uh, we provide our users with documentations for our data sets or methodologies and processes, for example, the Port Performance Freight Statistics Program provides a detailed technical documentation on our website, and the National Census of Ferry Operators provides its methodology along with its questionnaire. So uh, that's it for me. I'll turn it back to you, Commissioner. Uh, thanks, Sad Matt. That's great. Uh, uh, really good uh, uh, getting into the uh, different criteria that uh, is utilized out there and, uh, and your assessment on it. Um, uh, Jim Swanson or James, I, I don't know what you go by. Uh, 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 but uh, Director of Cargo Security and Controls, uh, CBP, a huge role in terms of, uh, of policing uh, the entry of cargo, uh, keeping track of, a, uh, of what's going into the country from a cargo perspective. I did want to interject a little bit. What we are looking at uh, at the FMC is uh, areas within our jurisdiction, which is international, intermodal, uh, regularly scheduled services. So that's containerized cargo. Uh, and, and, and things that uh, connect that cargo uh, through the supply chain to the ultimate point of a destination. So, uh, so there, but there's no problem in terms of references to uh, larger issues. We also are concerned about cruise ships, but uh, 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 Jim, uh, could you go ahead and, and, and give your perspectives? Sure. And as you can tell from my title, I'm less concerned about cruise ships and more concerned <laughs> with cargo movements into the United States. Uh, in our systems, our data collection systems are purpose built. Uh, they're designed to meet the statutory and regulatory requirements that CBP has to, has to enforce at the borders. So, for example, 
uh, let's start with this with the farthest out, which is the requirement that people submit data to us. They submit manifest level data, bill of lading level data, which we extract from our data elements line aligned with the contracts of carriage that NVOCCs and carriers collect overseas from shipments inbound to the United States 24 hours prior to the lading of that cargo on board a vessel at its last foreign port before it's ending, coming to the United States. That data, as you said, there's several required data elements. There's probably 30 or 40 total data elements that we collect on that, but most of them are designed around the security of the United States. So it is a, the ability before those goods are loaded on board the vessel to determine who the parties to the transaction are, what the cargo is, what kind of conveyance it's in, what kind of container it's in, uh, identification of that container so that we can check those databases to determine if, let's say, for example, that's previously been used to smuggle something, we can kind of look at that. So our purpose there is to determine at the earliest possible point that that data is, that that, that, that cargo should move to the United States. We have a couple of options there. One is we, obviously we target it. We send them a message back. We send a message back within our system that lets the carriers know that that data has been submitted. Uh, they, they know because they get the data back. In addition to our manifest data that we receive, we also have something called the importer security filing, also known within the community as 10 plus two. That data is only to be used for, for commercial, or only to be used for targeting purposes, to be used for national security requirements. It's basically some identifying data and key data from the transit from the shipping transaction. Largely, and some of that is, is data that doesn't, isn't necessarily attached to the bill of lading, but is important to the shipping transaction. And then there's roughly five data elements associated to the intended import of that data of that cargo on the, on the back end, And that's supplied usually by the importer or their agent. In addition to that, we also collect STO plan data so that we know prior to its arrival in the United States where it's loaded on board the vessel. Some of that has targeting capability or, or risk-based assessment capability, uh, but we leverage the STO plans as they're provided to the ports that allow them to help arrange for the loading and unloading of the conveyances. In addition, we also collect the container status messages that identifies container movements around the United States, around the world, so that we can better identify some of those container movements, et cetera. Um, we've been doing that now for almost 20 years, and we've built a significant list of that kind of data. That data, that early data is all tied to security. And as a result, we are not able to use it for commercial or trade enforcement purposes. We only use that data for, for risk assessment and targeting purposes. In addition, we also collect that same data, much of it is then converted over once it's inbound and it's used to identify the goods from a declaration perspective in the United States. So any data they provide us on that manifest then also becomes the declaration data. So we use that as a preliminary step to link the data, link the, link the, the cargo coming off the vessel, including containerized cargo to the various transactions associated with the clearance of that cargo. So the carrier provides that data. We know what's on board the vessel. We know which port it's going to unlaid at. We know where it's destined to. And from there, they, the various partners in the trade then provide us additional information. So in the case of a, com of a commercial entry, for example, a customs broker or the importer files a commercial entry, that data is provided. We link that data to the manifest. We use that for additional risk assessment. And then we establish the status of that transaction on the back end. So we then assign a value to that transaction that says that's released or it's not released. Here's the, trans here's the effort you have to take on that. And we kind of retain those cargos upon arrival until we complete all of our processes. But over 90% of that cargo is released usually five days out beyond the, the anticipated arrival date. And then that cargo moves into the United States once it's arrived, it then can begin to move into the commerce of the United States. And I say that because any cargo that we grant the release of, CBP kind of stops tracking it from a cargo perspective. At that point, we're, we're only interested in collecting revenue on that cargo. Other agents, it becomes domestic movement once it's offloaded from the vessel. And once it moves out of that terminal, it's all, or even in, within the terminal space, unless our risk assessment changes, we're primarily only interested in making sure we collect the revenue from that particular transaction. So we, we, we're focused on the security at the port, getting the goods cleared at that first port, or 
examined at that first port or detained at that first port, or if necessary, seized at that first port to prevent them from being introduced into the commerce of the United States. In addition to that, though, we do move a significant amount of cargo, 45, 48 million times last year. We moved cargo from those ports either through the country to export, or we moved it to a point in the, another point in the United States where somebody was paying and, and was processing the entry. So that cargo we actually do track from the time it leaves the initial port to the time it arrives in the subsequent port and then completes it whatever status and puts itself into that cleared, entered into the commerce of the United States or exported. So we trace that, we trace those shipments through the United States, but not physically. We're basically, we're tracing that the goods have left one port and arrived at another. We don't track the conveyances. We don't even, we even allow them to put it into a different container, for example, move it over to domestic equipment. Uh, that it would be a uh, domestic movement for movement purposes. At that and point. that would be bonded cargo? Uh, that, That's bonded that cargo. That's cargo. correct. That's okay. cargo moving under bond. Okay. We, we also have other bonded cargo that moves to deconsolidation facilities, what we call container freight stations, where containers move, they break it down, they break it down, some goes into the commerce where it lands, some moves across the country, some moves multiple legs across the country. But let's say there's a hundred shipments in a container that's deconsolidated at a single facility under the bond. We account for all that cargo and then it becomes a domestic move or it becomes the move that we trace if it's a bonded move from that point. That's a, bonded, a type of bonded facility. We also have bonded facilities where goods go to defer duty. So for those purposes, they're largely deemed to be in the, in the United States they're just not within the commerce of the United States for duty purposes. And we've got full accounting of all of that merchandise until it enters the commerce of the United States. The, the release capability, the ability to share that data comes from our, in the maritime environment, we're required by statute to release on a daily basis, we release all of the inbound bills of lading minus certain, I think it's 24 data elements on there. I don't have them all off the top of my head. Uh, and we grant confidentiality to shippers, consignees, and third parties who request that confidentiality. So we release that data. Most of it goes to data publishers and others who then publish and aggregate that data on a regular basis and use that as a way of identifying goods coming into the United States. I also, from my, as you can tell from my brief introduction, I also handle the exports of goods of cargo out of the United States. And we have seen the issues, we've been reported the, the issues with export. Right now, export is largely handled as a manual paper process. However, we are in the process of, we have a, three pilots, one in the maritime environment, uh, where we're, we're attempting to automate our electronic manifest so it aligns with our import manifest. And it's a very similar process and identifies all the cargo from the point it's originated for export and through to departure so that we're, we're gonna have some visibility, we're having better visibility into that cargo as it moves across the country. That right now is in a pilot phase. We have a few pilot participants. We're in the process of getting more pilot participants on board because quite frankly, we deem it to be essential to move forward with our future state strategy for export and, and export validation. Plus there's a lot of things that are not reported to census because they're exempt from census reporting whether by value, country they're headed to, et cetera. So we're attempting to capture the entire universe of export movement because we have enforcement authority over all of it. So we're attempting to better capture that, determine which pieces need to go, and also to be able to handle the physical export of those goods and to document that those goods have actually left the United States by linking to the conveyance movements out of the United States. So that's how we handle the cargo. And I just wanna briefly cover the fact that we are also in the process of automating our entrance and clearance process. Right now, it's been a manual process carrying documents that in some cases go back to 1789, the entrance and clearance, master's oath of the conveyance, uh, all of the certificates provided, et cetera, have all been collected manually at ports. We are in the process now of completing our, our, our phases of automation where all of that data can be submitted to us electronically and we can allow both the entrance and clearance of a vessel through the collection of entrance of, of electronic data, allow the, allow the offloading of that conveyance upon arrival in the port um, and do all of that as electronically as possible. And the third big piece, and I noticed it got brought up was the different definitions upon arrival. And we run into that ourselves because we have two separate definitions that we're kind of working from as well. One involves the conveyances, which allows the carriers to report when they deem those conveyances to be arrived for their purposes. And the other is for entry purposes, which allow it when it arrives, arrives 
with intent to unlaid within the statutory port limits of the United States. I wish I could say we have a solution for that. <laughs> We're working on it right now. And it, so we have, a, we have a bit of a visibility gap, especially now with the West Coast, with the West Coast backups of vessels arriving within the anchorage in LA Basin, for example, and preparing to clear and sitting for three or four weeks. Many of those, at least the ones within the port line, are actually eligible for arrival, but the carriers are not reporting their arrival because they use all those other processes that kick off all of our processes on the back end, kick off upon their, their tying up to the pier. So it's kind of our interest arrives when it, when it arrives at the pier for all of our other processes. But there is, a, there is a quirk in the law that allows for that arrival to occur much earlier. And we kind of have a variable time frame between arrival at Anchorage and arrival at the pier where we allow that carrier to report. Uh, at this point, we don't have a solution, but we're working on trying to identify one because one of the things we have found is with variable entry data and variable duty rates, goods that arrive on December 31st have a lower duty rate than goods that arrive on January 1st. And when they arrive within the port limits with the intent to unlaid on January 31st, but we don't arrive them within the port until January 1st, they pay a significant, they can pay significantly more money. And so it's not just a matter of delays causing additional cost, but something as simple as that as, as a missed date uh, could cause that to happen as well. And so we're looking for the way we can solve that and get to some of those questions. You'll, you'll hear us talking about that in various public fora. And I just wanted to make sure I brought that up because it is one of those data points that are kind of a point of contention for us based on various, various rules, similar to what you have overall with, with dates of arrival, ports of arrival, et cetera, being, being different based on the purpose for which they're applied. Don't know if I covered your questions, but I was trying you to get- did. Uh, that was perfect. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, we're developing, even though uh, maritime industry is arcane in terms of, uh, we, we started in 1916 and we're probably one of the, uh, uh, the, the uh, younger maritime agencies and, uh, and uh, it is arcane. Uh, uh, but we're very concerned with, uh, with uh, establishing a baseline uh, lexicon going forward. So we want to work uh, closely with customs. We're not going to be looking at the internal uh, uh, cargo uh, that's in the containers, but we want to know uh, more uh, where status is, what the status of movement is, uh, when, it's, uh, when it's available uh, for, for pickup or, or, or subsequent, a subsequent move. Um, in, in LA Long Beach, they've developed a new term uh, for shipping. Shipping used to just get to a spot at the berth and unload cargo. And the past two years now, we have 150 vessels offshore waiting to get into the United States. Uh, and they kicked them further offshore. Uh, so they're now not in uh, berths, uh, anchorages that has been established by the Coast Guard, uh, but they're now loitering. And that's right. a new term that I have never heard in my 30 years. Uh, so they're not really loitering. They're just waiting to get to port in the United States. And so these are the things that have implications on your enforcement activities uh, and, and, and on, on other things. So we need to, 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 to consider those. So we'll be uh, reaching back out to you uh, to make sure uh, that we can uh, look closely at, at these issues and uh, uh, the definitions of the lexicon. Um, um, so, so to bring to the table some additional documentation, our cbp.gov website, there's a ACE page that contains all of our data dictionary okay. slash transaction. So feel free, any, any of your analysts, to look at that because we've laid it all out in, in, in implementation guides that spell out all of the data we collect, what the data definitions are, under what conditions we collect it. Yeah, I, I, we, we're going to have another meeting at, at some point and, and we'll start off with that. So, so thanks for that. Uh, and, and again, it's critical uh, what you do uh, as, as, a, as an agency in terms of our, our protection. Uh, but we're, uh, we, we want to make sure this commercial element is, is structured the right way in terms of information and, and how we uh, encourage efficiency. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn to April Taylor, uh, Economist, Transportation Services Division, uh, Department of Agriculture. We're dealing a lot with uh, export uh, uh, commodity issues and uh, people not having services uh, provided or missing uh, vessels that, that uh, were supposed to be there to take perishable goods. Uh, and it's been a, a really difficult time. I appreciate the efforts that the department is doing uh, and really interested 
and a lot of the data you do on forecasting, I think we need to do better uh, providing the shipping lines uh, information with what's what what can be uh, uh, exported and what will be exported. But uh, I'm going to turn over uh, to you for uh, your comments. Thanks, Commissioner Benzel. Just wanted to make sure. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. yes. Wonderful. Thank you. Appreciate that. Well, thanks for the time today and thanks for uh, bringing together this federal partners group. Um, I think it's critical and I, I appreciate being able to be a part of it. Um, and USDA appreciates being able to be a part of this. Uh, we find ourselves at the USDA um, in our particular group as we were a small group of economists that look just at transportation, just of agricultural commodities. So we find ourselves at that crux of the place of where we're very interested in trade and we're very interested in transportation at the same time. And at that very crux is where you find a lot of our challenges that we face is trying to um, marry that trade data with our transportation data at the same time. So uh, I'll just kind of wanted to preface it, my comments with that piece of it, uh, knowing that uh, that's kind of where the most of our um, angst, if you want to call it, <laughs> uh, lies. So anyway, uh, our group basically relies for container movements. Obviously, my comments today will focus mostly, mostly on container movements. So obviously, we look at all uh, modes of transportation in our particular group. Uh, we uh, rely mostly on bill of lading data, as Mr. Swanson had shown, has shown very great detail. Uh, we, bought, we purchase bill of lading data where we rely on that information for volume, U.S. ports, export and import, uh, the carrier specific information, the container and bulk uh, indications, the refrigerated and dry indications, our trading partners, uh, those foreign ports uh, for access of those foreign ports, we, we use that information as well, as well as any transshipment ports as well. All of that information has been crucial during this pandemic stage, you know, where are our containers actually stuck on a transshipment port? for example, or um, you know, what foreign ports are, are, are also congested uh, to be able to get our products um, uh, into those uh, particular markets. So all of these trade um, elements and uh, data elements have been very crucial in, in looking at this overall situation. In addition to those um, bill of lading data we purchase, we also have some uh, spot rate information that we purchase as well. Uh, for, both east, for both east and westbound trans-Pacific trade lanes uh, as our proxy of information that we have for them. So we, we do that as well. We do not, unfortunately, have ag-specific uh, uh, rate information, although we would love an extra conversation with you guys at FMC to figure out how we might be able to address that in the future. We also have vessel fleet information that we look at. Again, we're at this crux of trying to determine transportation versus agricultural trade. So we have to be able to understand the bigger transportation picture while still trying to apply our agriculture shipments to it. So we have a lot of information that we look at from a very global perspective um, and then try to apply our agricultural specific information as best we can to it. So we have um, global vessel fleet data that we purchase, which also helps us understand uh, idle fleet uh, percentages and things of that nature as well, helping us to understand what the capacity looks like out there for, uh, for the agricultural export community. We obviously uh, monitor vessel activity at the key port She's and AIS data as well, as uh, Matt had mentioned previously. And probably our greatest resource is our stakeholders. Uh, we do some extensive outreach to our agricultural community. And those are our greatest resource uh, where we get the best information, the most uh, accurate, obviously, information, the most applicable uh, for the agricultural community and for our particular um, uh, policymakers as well. So in addition to that, we have cooperative research that we do as well. This is more long-term research that we do. So it's not really um, real-time or even close to real-time data, but it allows us to do more mm -hmm. analytical work on it. Some of those examples will be, we've done some on chassis availability um, for agricultural movements. We've done one recently just on technology, uh, which might be of interest to you, Commissioner Benzel, as I know that you're working on another uh, initiative as well. So that one uh, might be also very interesting. So, um, so those are our main data pieces, if you will, or where we get information in our data from. So your next question is, uh, so where, you know, what, what cautions do we have out there that, you know, that came up? Obviously, at that crux between trade and transportation data is where we find things like uh, commodity classifications uh, can be very, can widely vary. 
uh, on bill of lading information, they don't have to be as accurate as they have to be with our friends at the Department of Commerce, right? They have to be very accurate on what that commodity is, whereas they don't necessarily have to be that accurate on a bill of lading information. So uh, trying, to, um, trying to marry up those two, we find trouble there. Also, as also has been mentioned several times, port identification as well. Uh, isn't always uh, perfectly matched as well. So that's where we find ourselves trying to make and manipulate some of the data in order to make it work uh, for our constituencies as well. So um, also some of the trade data obviously doesn't have as much of the detailed information in the transportation side as we'd like. So as I mentioned earlier, some of the carrier specific information. Uh, that's been crucial these days when looking at uh, what carriers are actually moving our agricultural commodities. We've had to really rely on that. Uh, but again, it's going to that transportation data versus the trade data, and they don't always line up perfectly. Uh, also, refer refrigerated versus dry, obviously very important to our agricultural contingency, and uh, we don't always are able to get that kind of information in official trade data. So um, just to wrap up, I'll just say that um, as we find our greatest resource to be our stakeholders, I want to uh, commend you guys for a little re reaching out to all of the applicable parties in this uh, particular conversation and bringing all of them to the table um, and the outreach activities that you guys are doing this. Well, I think that's your biggest asset through all of this. So thanks for the time and I'm happy to take any questions. That's great. I, I, uh, you know, I, there's such a big role for your department, especially in forecasting. And as you know, uh, the agricultural products tend to go and uh, when the products uh, are, are, are the highest. And so they have uh, more unique needs than some of the other retail goods. And so uh, the forecasting, uh, I, I think is incredibly important for, for the industry to be able to handle uh, uh, the exports of US uh, commodities better. So. Uh, well, we, uh, I will follow up with you as, as well, and our folks will, because there's a lot, a lot more to discuss in this area. So uh, look forward to that in the future. Um, uh, Baron Linforce, uh, statistician, oh, excuse me, uh, uh, Olivia Volkoff, uh, uh, Policy Advisor Office of the Secretary, uh, Department of Commerce, of course, very important. This is all commerce that we're talking about, and we've, we've talked before about the challenges with the supply chain and uh, Go ahead and give us uh, your observations. Absolutely. And um, my colleague, Baron um, from the Census Bureau is also going to contribute um, for Department of Commerce. Um, but thank you, Commissioner Benzel um, and to the Federal Maritime Commission for hosting this conversation. I really appreciate your time today and appreciate the efforts of the, of the FMC on this initiative. Um, and like I mentioned, uh, we'll also be hearing more specifically from the Census Bureau about their um, insights and experience with our data sets. Um, just very briefly, some of you may be familiar with the Department of Commerce and its structure, but for just very brief background, the department has 12 different bureaus, um, each with its own mission, but all directly related to the department's overarching goal of job creation and economic growth. Um, and as part of that, data is really central to our work at the department. Um, and several of our bureaus conduct data collection and dissemination. Um, and so I wanted to start by highlighting some of the relevant work um, to today's topic of maritime data um, in the Census Bureau, NOAA, um, and the International Trade Administration. Um, so the two primary sources of maritime transportation data at Commerce are from Census and NOAA. Um, the maritime data from Census and NOAA have different focuses, with Census really focused on economic and trade data, and then NOAA more on maritime climate conditions, coastlines, um, you know, that impact transportation. And so with Census, Barron's going to expand on this, but the two most relevant programs um, to maritime data are the um, Foreign Trade Program and the Commodity Flow Survey. Um, so through the Foreign Trade Program, the Census Bureau develops and publishes monthly and annual statistics on the value and weight of imports and exports through our maritime and airports. Um, so Commissioner Benzel, to your earlier point about real time, like that's that's kind of the close, closest we get in terms of like real time um, trade data. Um, and that data is also available publicly um, through our USA trade online database. Um, Separately, Census collects and publishes a mandatory transportation industry survey called the Commodity Flow Survey. Um, and that data is collected every five years as part of the economic census uh, and, and provides a modal picture of national freight flows. Um, and that's a joint effort between Census and the Bureau of Transportation Statistics. Um, 
briefly to touch on NOAA. So the National Ocean Service, um, they provide a significant amount of data that supports maritime tr transportation, but really the focus is on nautical charts, tides, currents, geodesy, um, hydrographic surveys, et cetera. Um, and the National Weather Service also runs a substantial program for um, marine weather. And then lastly, I, I wanted to mention my colleagues um, at the International Trade Administration as well. Um, while they don't compile mar maritime data um, per se, the ITA team does play a role in this conversation. Um, they're an active resource on how industry stakeholders can use and share um, port and inland supply chain data to facilitate maritime trade flows. Um, they also have been working very closely with supply chain stakeholders for many years um, to support the development of supply chain wide uh, data sharing portals, technologies, standards. And I think I, I mentioned it really just because I think they can be a very strong resource for the effort um, that you are undertaking currently. Um, and uh, also ITA, they do run a federal advisory committee called the Advisory Committee on Supply Chain Competitiveness um, that has historically had kind of multiple um, you know, prongs to their work, but one of which is, has historically been data focused. Um, and they have published recommendations on this topic as well. Um, and the secretary did actually just relaunch that committee on January 20th um, alongside Brian Deese um, and John Porcari. Um, and I think her goal is to have that committee be a, a source of new ideas and solutions and hopefully can contribute to your initiative as well. Um, and I guess as far as kind of key lessons learned and cautions that you asked about, um, I think I, I will turn it over to Baron to talk a little bit more specifically about this. But um, I think one thing that came across to me in our conversations was the application of uh, machine learning tools to help um, identify and classify data um, that comes into commerce and how that can help improve um, improve accuracy and kind of reduce burden on uh, reportees. And then um, to your last point about best practices and pieces of advice, I think from talking to like many of my colleagues across commerce that deal um, you know, with data collection and dissemination, they really emphasize just the importance of um, stakeholder engagement and making, you know, making sure you make it very clear kind of what you are trying to accomplish and taking into account your, your audience's needs um, and make it kind of a collaborative effort. And so um, I think that obviously that's something that you are doing uh, with, the, with this maritime data initiative is you're engaging stakeholders. Um, so Baron, if, if you're on the line, I'll, I'll turn it over to you if you want to talk more specifically about the commodity flow survey. Uh, yeah, thanks. Can everyone hear me okay? Good. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'll just follow up a little bit on the commodity flow survey, which is um, certainly the one that I know the best because that's the one I work on. Um, so I think uh, uh, something that applies pretty well here is is um, us looking into machine learning to classify uh, commodities on, on this. Um, so historically, this it's a shipper-based survey, and we've asked respondents to um, physically classify their their goods per shipment, um, and that, especially since we've been asking for more and more shipments over time, has has become quite a burden on the respondent. Um, so we've undertaken um, a machine learning. Um, we have a data scientist working on some machine learning stuff. That this is the this is the actually the first cycle coming up that we're going to just ask for descriptions and take those descriptions and then classify everything ourselves. Um, and I think some of the opportunities that this open up is that um, I think, like was said in uh, one of the previous uh, folks that was talking, there are there are several different commodity coding structures, probably too many, um, and they're each slightly different and kind of have different groups in mind. But if you have uh, decent descriptions, you know, you, theoretically you could code into various coding structures, and you could conceivably publish in various coding structures. Um, so I think that is really the only way we're going to be able to kind of push this survey into the future um, is, is, is through some of these machine learning tools. And then I think we're also looking at, at doing this for, for mode possibly in the future too. A lot of times when we ask somebody to uh, give us their shipment data, they don't always know all the various modes um, that uh, a shipment has traveled um, and using some machine learning tools. 
it's going to be possible to maybe pick up some more of those modes um, along the way. Um, and then I think just for some of the other questions to kind of dovetail with what some of the other folks have said, like we, we publish a pretty extensive methodology out on the census.gov website under commodity flow survey. Um, census is probably different than most places because we have a lot of statisticians. So we actually break up most of our surveys into what we call mathematical statisticians, which work on the methodology and um, uh, some of the, the, the estimation techniques and stuff like that. And then um, survey statisticians, which would be my side, which is like working with respondents and analyzing the data. Um, so I know not every, every agency can do that because they tend to not have tons of statisticians like we do, but I think that helps quite a bit um, with stuff like this. Um, so I, I would I would encourage anyone to go out to the census.gov website and look up the commodity flow survey um, and and the and the foreign trade data as well. And actually, one more thing that there there are some kind of transportation level data on these new uh, pulse surveys, which um, the Census Bureau has started. Which there's a small business pulse survey and household pulse survey, and there are some questions about. Um, on this, definitely on the small business side about like supply chain issues um, that might be helpful for this group. Uh, thanks, Baron. That's great. Uh, Olivia, uh, again, nice to see you. Uh, Department of Commerce is going to be a great help as we go through this. Uh, we, uh, we've had a number of discussions with the supply chain advisory uh, uh, committee uh, and uh, hope uh, and, and look forward to working with them. Uh, further as we go through. And I will tell you the ports data that NOAA puts out is critical to uh, the shipments. Uh, if you can't get in uh, because there's fog in Savannah, you wait and we're waiting. And that's uh, contributing to some of the congestion issues we have in addition to these commodity flows. Uh, but it is, uh, I would say it's incredibly complex system. I was talking to, uh, uh, I was at the National Targeting Center with uh, CBP they said that they'd had a container in that had 10,000 bills of lading in it, uh, uh, meaning 10,000 individual shipments in one container. Uh, and e-commerce has created uh, some advantages to consumers, but also created uh, some nightmares to statisticians and people trying to track cargo and, and make the system um, uh, easier uh, to follow. Uh, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to just put out a statement. It seems that everyone uh, every federal agency would do better if we had real time uh, information that was related to shipments. Uh, and, you know, there's reference to AIS data, and there's six private companies that provide AIS data out there. Some of it's better than others. Uh, but you go to an airport and you have a board there, and it tells you when you're going to be able to get on the airplane. Uh, and we're sort of guessing what, what is included in that data. And sometimes the data doesn't say, hey, I'm just going to be waiting and I don't know how long I'm going to be waiting, uh, but we're not getting the level of info information on real time. So, so I think it would be a, uh, a value to every federal agency out there if we had uh, better connectivity information on a real time basis. Uh, uh, and, and with that, I'm going to turn over to our economist, uh, statistician, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Kristen Monaco. Uh, and uh, and uh, she's she talks to talk. Uh, I talk po uh, politics and maritime po uh, policy. So uh, so she's going to have some additional questions for you. But I want to thank uh, everyone for the participation. I, we're going to be back in contact with all of your uh, agencies, uh, departments. Uh, it's uh, a, a great reservoir of of, uh, of uh, perspective on a lot of different different areas that need to be considered in this. Kristen, why don't you go ahead? Thanks, um, Commissioner Benson. So a couple of questions um, for different people and feel free to jump in if you have insight. I think a valuable um, thing that Matt mentioned, but very briefly, and then sort of loops back to a, a comment Baron made, but starting with Matt and maybe April as well, Matt mentioned crosswalks, right? Which is we can't necessarily get uniformity in definitions across all different stakeholder groups, crosswalks can help us sort of align different sources and make them useful to people. But Matt, how much sort of time and energy and 
what have you learned about putting together these crosswalks? What are the challenges? And you know, has it gotten easier over time? Um, and April, you may also want to weigh in on crosswalking data to make it applicable to um, your work at USDA. Well, it depends on the level you're looking at the data, but some of the data, you know, if you're working down at the lower level, like docs, they can be rolled up into terminals and can be rolled up in the port. So if you have that micro data, then you can roll it up to higher level. Um, but it's when you're trying to start. So like we've just mentioned the uh, U.S. trade statistics versus like the waterborne commerce statistics. Um, since they're built on different port definitions, there's no great way to crosswalk between the two. But if you got back down to the dock level, then that's where you can crosswalk between the two. Um, so that that's kind of, it's breaking the data down to understand it. Um, and then, you know, AIS is another one, you know, looking at the vessel registry and vessel types, you know, if you're already rolled all the way up, it's hard to compare. Whereas if you're down at the lower level or have another identifier like the MMSI or the IMO number, then you can reclassify the vessel for the data. So that that's kind of the thing is trying to get down to the lowest common dominant denominator before trying to do any of your analysis um, is key to that. We'll, we'll leave it on that. Hopefully I have never confused everybody on the call. That makes sense to me. If you can't get to the lowest common denominator, what's sort of the, who are the arbiters of that within BTS or how do you align that when you can't quite match it up? What decisions do you make and how do you document that and how do you get buy-in? Um, first off, Sometimes certain data sets are good for different purposes. Uh, so some form follows function, or, you know. So like the US trade statistics are great because they're published monthly. So if you want monthly data, that's a great source. Um, if you're doing national numbers, it works always, you know, that's, that's gonna be a good source um, for the port level data. But if you're looking at, you know, going down to the port or lower level, then, you know, that's when the waterborne commerce statistics data may be the better data set. Um, because it's by waterway port and it's got a lower granularity to it. So that, that's kind of what may decide what data set to go with. Um, now trying to crosswalk the two, I have not actually tried that. So once it's all rolled up to the national level or port level. Great, thank you. Um, April, do you have any sort of experience or thoughts about crosswalks from the USDA perspective? I know it's challenging for your organization because you have very specific needs for your stakeholders and the data doesn't always quite come in that shape. That's true, yeah. And I think, you know, one of the one of the things that we, again, as much like Matt was just saying, it kind of depends on what the question is that we're trying to answer, you know. Um, if we're looking at official like trade information, if somebody needs to know what the trade value was for these particular commodities, we obviously have to default to our, our friends at Commerce and, and use the um, U.S. official trade numbers because we don't want to start, you know, reporting different information from different agencies and things of that nature. So we try to be as consistent as possible with that. And obviously our friends at the Foreign Agricultural Service at USDA also get the data from census. So we want to make sure we're consistent across the different department as well. So, um, so we tried to, you know, when we're looking, when you're looking at, at transportation, you know, I'll, obviously a lot of people are, you know, just assume we, you know, transportation and trade will always be the same, you know, will always be the same thing. And so you have to kind of really tease out what there is they're looking for. And at that time, then we decide, okay, well, um, I really need to rely on census data for this, or I really need to rely on official trade numbers for this, or else, you know, if it's something very transportation specific, you know, very port specific, very, um, very foreign port specific, or very carrier specific, or refrigerated specific, something like that, then we rely more on our transportation data at that point to be able to tell the story that they're looking for. Um, but again, trying to, you know, do some crosswalks, we haven't really um, pushed too hard on that. There is some data cleanup that we have to do, even within the transportation information that we have. Um, as I mentioned before, you don't have to be overly specific on the bill of lading uh, for a lot of information. So a lot of times things get very generalized. Uh, one of the big ones that we face is the Port of New Orleans. Um, and this isn't container specific, I know, but uh, there isn't actually a physical grain elevator at the Port of New Orleans. But according to our data set, all kinds of grain gets exported out of the Port of New Orleans. So there's a lot of cleanup that has to get done in order for us to really be able to tease out what actually moves out of the physical port of New Orleans and what is associated with the other great ports in that region as well. So. 
Understood. Thank you. That's a really great illustration of sort of unexpected data challenges um, when you sort of superimpose data on the real world and see inconsistencies there. Um, I wanted to quickly, and I think we have like one minute. So let's talk machine learning for one minute um, with our colleague from the Census Bureau. Um, I think one of the things that's fantastic, as you pointed out, about using machine learning and applying it is that you, in theory, can then structure it almost any way you want. And it can help with some of these crosswalking problems. I am sort of interested in the underlying information you're using to train the data. So what's the corpus of information that's going into this? Is it past surveys or is there supplemental data as well? It's mainly past surveys. Um, and I can certainly put you in touch with the data scientist too that, that, that has, has spent more time working on this than I have. But I think this actually worked out quite well for us because we, we, we used to ask um, for a description and to have them attempt to code it. Um, so we had a pretty good training set that, you know, then my analysts could go in and clean up some of that stuff too, um, to get a pretty good um, training set from that. And then we, he has added some other things in over time too, but, but mainly it's, it's prior responses to surveys, yes. That's fantastic. I'll be interested to hear more about that. And I think April would love it if we could apply some machine learning to some FMC data and get her some rates and prices on ag. So um, I think there's good conversations to be had moving forward. But I'm going to turn it back to the commissioner because I'm mindful that we're slightly over time. Yeah, we have we have another meeting. Uh, otherwise, we, we go on. We are going to be back in contact with, with all of you. Uh, it's too important not to, to get this right. Uh, I will tell you, I studied down in New Orleans. There's a port around every uh, bend in the river in, uh, in uh, New Orleans. So uh, you don't know where the grain elevators are, but they're all up and down that river. Um, so that is a challenge. But, but anyways, I wanted to thank everyone for their uh, participation. Um, uh, great information. I think we'll have to uh, go back and review the tape and, and look further. And uh, thank you for providing uh, information about uh, where your sources are, descriptive uh, information that we can take a look at. And, uh, and again, uh, uh, we look forward to uh, meeting again and, and uh, as we go through this process uh, and uh, your advice and thoughts. And with that, uh, Carl, I think we'll, we can, we can uh, uh, gavel it closed. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.